Hello, sports fans, and welcome back to Ball Games and Beyond. I am your host, Evan Grote, and Ball Games and Beyond is brought to you by SportsNot.com. Now, please do me a favor, go out there and subscribe and follow to the Sports Not YouTube channel. Make sure you do that and click the notifications bell as well. We put all kinds of new content up on the YouTube channel for you guys, so make sure you're checking that all out. And if you want to listen to the audio form of Ball Games and Beyond, you can do that by heading over to your favorite podcasting platform, uh, searching Ball Games and Beyond, and you'll be able to find it there. And don't be afraid to leave me a five-star review and rating if you don't mind. And uh, again, if you're looking to follow more of my content, just some of my general thoughts on sports, I like to put them out there. You may not always agree, but I put them out there. You can do that over at X, uh, and you can follow me on X at egro 5 Now, for this week's show... Again, last week we talked about golf. We talked about Scotty Scheffler and his dominance of late winning at the Masters. He won again this past weekend at the RBC Heritage Tournament. What a run he is on right now, winning four of his last five tournaments. Uh, he, he's, he's red hot right now. Uh, another topic that I was thinking about going with this week is the NFL Draft. I'm actually not going to talk draft uh, this week on the show, but if you're looking for draft content, we've got plenty of that for you available at sportsnot.com. So head over there to get your fill of NFL draft content. What we're going to focus on this week on Ball Games and Beyond is the NBA. The playoffs are now underway, and what I want to do is I want to focus on one team specifically, and that is the Boston Celtics. They are in search of of their first title since 2008 championship number 18, which would put them alone at the top of the championship standings right now. They're currently tied with the Los Angeles Lakers at championship 17. We'll see if the, uh, if, if the Celtics can get it done this year to me. And this is the question I want to put out there to you guys. In my opinion, this is a championship or bus season for the Boston Celtics. This is a very prideful organization who's had a lot of success, a very, very rich history uh, with, with all the championships that they have won, with all the great talent that they have had come through uh, that, that, that franchise. Uh, anything less than a championship, to me, would be a major, major disappointment. Now, we're going to be joined by our guest this week in just a few minutes, Gary Washburn. Now, Gary covers the NBA uh, for the Boston Globe, but we're going to talk to him specifically about the Celtics because he is located there in Boston. He has a really good pulse on the Boston, Boston sports fan and what's going on with the Celtics. Now, I want you to think back just uh, a year ago. The Celtics, uh, again, had a really, really good team, made it to the playoffs, lost, though, in embarrassing fashion in the Eastern Conference Finals, Game 7 to the Heat. They were embarrassed at home. And they were down 3-0 in that series, you may recall. They stormed all the way back, showed some showed some heart and showed some guts. But ultimately, that loss left a very, very sour taste in their mouth. And think back just a, two years ago, actually, go back a little further, they made it to the NBA Finals where they lost to the Golden State Warriors. So this team has been very, very close. But when we're talking about the Boston Celtics, close just isn't good enough. The expectations for the Boston Celtics is that they are going to be champions. And that's how the great organizations are measured. When you think about the New York Yankees, who are another organization that they measure their success on championships. Getting to the championship is not enough. You have to win it. And so that's what we're going to focus on this week uh, is whether or not the, the, the Celtics can fully uh, achieve their championship aspirations. They were very, very aggressive this past offseason to upgrade the roster. They made a lot of roster moves. They lost a few guys, but they brought in some really high-end talent in Kristop Porzingis, seven-footer who can shoot threes. They brought in... Uh, Point guard Drew Holiday, who has championship DNA from his time with the Bucks. He's a defensive specialist. This was an already really good team, and they took it to a whole nother level this year, winning 64 games in the regular season. They easily won their, their division and are the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. Can they seal the deal 
and get it done by winning championship number 18. We'll discuss that and more coming up next on Ball Games and Beyond with our guest, NBA writer from the Boston Globe, Gary Washburn. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back now to Ball Games and Beyond. It is time now to welcome in our guest from the Boston Globe. Uh, Gary Washburn is joining us here on the show. He covers the NBA very closely for the Globe, and we're going to ask him about the Boston Celtics and their championship aspirations this season as the playoffs are now underway. Uh, I know it's a very busy time for you, Gary, so we appreciate you uh, making a few minutes for us, and welcome to the show. Oh, good to be here. All right, Gary, let's let's jump right into it. Uh, Celtics Heat Game 2 is set for Wednesday night. The Celtics already off to a a 1-0 series lead after they uh, won in very convincing fashion the other night. They shot the lights out from three-point range, making 22 out of 49 attempts, and that's been kind of the recipe for them all season long. Uh, I think the series lost a bit of its juice when we found out that Jimmy Butler wasn't going to be available to play uh, I don't think there's much that the Heat can do. I don't think this series is go is going to go very far. But I just want to get some of your thoughts on uh, this Heat Celtics series and if there's anything that the Heat can do to try to slow down this this Celtics ball club right now. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Uh, they're short of obviously a lot of personnel when you not only mention Jimmy Butler but Terry Rozier and then uh, Duncan Robinson. I don't think is is near a hundred percent at all. So they're relying on guys like. Nikki, Nikola Jovic, uh, Jovic uh, Hami Hakez Jr., a rookie, um, Haywood Highsmith, guys that have uh, had strong seasons for them in terms of you know being complementary players but not primary primary players. So the, the firepower just isn't there. Now you're leaving the primary scoring option to Tyler Hero, um, who can be really good when he's on but also can be wildly inconsistent. Um and so they're not a real volume three-point shooting team, and they're playing one, and that makes it difficult because you got to match three for three at times unless you, the Celtics go into a real three-point shooting skid, have trouble scoring, and then you know you can make it a, an uglier game, a you know 105, 104, that type of game, 99, 96, like some of the other playoff games we've seen around the league. Um, but the Celtics, the number two offense in the league, number uh, one uh, three-point shooting team in the league. So it makes it difficult. So I think the the Heat are just going to have to, A, take more threes and hope that they get hot, B, hope for a cold night from the Celtics, and C, just hope that they're off their game physically, mentally, in terms of the physicality of it, arguing with officials, maybe some altercations and some tough tough plays. I know um, there's a couple of tough plays in game one, especially the Caleb Martin foul on Jason Tatum. You're going to have to unnerve the Celtics. And I don't know if the Heat can do that four times. I think they can maybe do that once. But this is a key game for the Celtics. You don't want to go back to Miami with any momentum for the Heat and, and go back two games in Miami and know that you got to probably split those and then suddenly it's a best of three or anything like that. Like You want to knock this, this team out. So uh, the focus for the Celtics should be to adjust to any of Miami's adjustments because we all know that Miami's going to be better uh, than they were in game one. Yeah, you mentioned the the three-point shooting uh, by the Celtics, and one of the things that I heard Eric Spolstra talk about the other day was that they need to do a better job of limiting the three-point attempts by the Celtics, and they need to increase the volume of their uh, three-point shooting attempts. And, you know, that again, I mentioned that's been the recipe for the Celtics all year long is to kind of live and die by the three-point. Do you think they're too a little, uh, a little too reliant on the three-point shot? I saw an interesting stat here that I want to share with you guys. Uh, in Boston, 64 wins this season. They shot 40.6% from three-point range compared to just 32.4%. In their 18 losses, so there is a there is a correlation there, obviously, between when they shoot the ball really well. Do you think that's a recipe that could be trouble for them? I mean, over the course of a, a long 82 game season, that philosophy has worked. But in these shorter series where the games are more intense, you're going to see better defenses. Do you think that's something that could possibly hamper the Celtics? Yeah, it could be an issue. I don't know if it's this series, but down the road, I think it's not only the percentage with the volume. The question is, are the Celtics just consumed with taking threes? Or 
they can win games when they have off nights from three. And I think it's pretty normal that a team shoots less percentage from the field in losses than wins. I mean, I don't think that's a huge, uh, you know, mind-blowing stat. But I also think it does let you know that when the Celtics are not uh, accurate from the three-point line, they can be more vulnerable and beatable. And the question is, are they taking 50 and they're only hitting, you know, 15? Um, or are they taking 30 and they're hitting 10, but they're also scoring from the two-point line. They're also getting to the free throw line. They can be a quali- still a very quality team when they're not efficient from the three-point line, when they rely on Tatum to, to penetrate or hit, shoot from the two. Same with Jalen Brown. Chris Porzingis get to the free throw line. Derek White hitting that floater. They have two-point makers, but they also have very good three-point shooters, if you include Sam Hauser or Peyton Pritchard. Tatum's been a little inconsistent. And that's the point the Celtics also have to probably focus on here is that Tatum was one for eight from three, and they did not play their A game in game one. It sounded like they did, 114-94, up up, up 34, but Jalen Brown had 17 points and Tatum had 23. And and their average together is, I think, 52, uh, 52, something like that. So they both scored below their season average. They got help from the bench. But it wasn't as if you got A-game Tatum and A-game Brown and they just destroyed the heat. Both those guys can be better, especially Tatum, obviously missing seven of his eight three-point shots. When he gets going, they're almost unbeatable because he's been inconsistent this year from the three. But I also think they can do other things besides shooting the three. The key to Boston is the amount, the attempts, and the situations when they shoot threes. When they're behind, are they shooting pull-up threes? Are they shooting early shot clock threes? Are they shooting threes when, you know, from a guy who just isn't hot? You know, and they're just, he's open, so he shoots it. Like, but if they get the ball movement going, the situation, yeah, they're really hard to beat shooting that three because they can create so many open opportunities. So that is a something to look out for um, in terms of, like, their three-point percentage. But They've got to figure out, and they have this season, other ways to win when they're not shooting a three. Yeah. Uh, You know, in sports, there are certain organizations, and I can think of a few. I can think of the Yankees in Major League Baseball, the Dallas Cowboys in in football. And I I think that the Celtics fit this criteria in in the NBA. There are certain organizations that measure their success – solely on winning a championship. And I, and I think that is the case that we're doing with the, the Celtics right now. Their season ended on a very sour note last year, losing at home uh, game seven in the Eastern conference finals. They were very aggressive to go out there and, and bring in Porzingis and holiday to an already really good team. Uh, what I'm saying is to me, this season has shaped up. And now that they are in the playoffs after a 64 win season, this has shaped up to be a championship or bust season for the Celtics. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, that's what they have shot for for the last several years. They've, they've been to a finals. They lost in 22. They've been to five Eastern Conference finals, lost to, uh, you know, to Miami twice and, and then a couple to LeBron and those guys uh, back in the early, late 2010. So they have proven capable but they just haven't gotten over the hump. And I just think that they knew after last year's Eastern Conference Finals, because if you look at what Denver did to Miami and beats them in five, and it was just like Denver was a better team than Boston. And I think the Celtics looked at that and said, we see what the Nuggets did to Miami, and we this team beat us in seven. We've got to do something different. So they made some roster changes, obviously. Trading away Marcus Smart, getting Porzingis, um, at the end of the summer, getting Drew Holiday, moving on with Mark, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, letting Grant Williams go to the to the Dallas Mavericks, and, and picking up guys like a O'Shaper said, and and you know guys you know in, in the trade deadline getting Xavier Tillman, so they've made some changes, and I just think it's for this window. Now, if they don't win it this year, are they going to give up and not go next year? No, they're going to go hard next year too. This team is signed all through next year. Derek White's the only player, I think, who isn't signed uh, past a couple of years from now. Like, everybody else is locked in. Derek White has one more year after this year in his contract. They just signed Drew Holiday. Jason Tatum's going to re-sign this summer. Brown signed a $300 million deal last summer. 
So they're going to go for it for multiple years, but they feel like with finishing and winning the East by 14 games, the West, you know, being great teams in the West, but not unbeatable. Denver's probably the team that they're probably focusing on. I think they feel like they could beat Minnesota. They could beat Oklahoma City. Um, They're looking at Denver, and they feel like we got to get to that point first, but they feel like they can get over the hump. And so the emphasis is on this year. It's not win or bust because there is always next year, but it would be highly disappointing for them not to even get to, to, to finish short of their goal. Our guest this week on Ball Games and Beyond is Gary Washburn, NBA writer uh, for the Boston Globe, and we're chatting a bit about the Boston Celtics and their championship aspirations this year. Um, you know, do you think there's any extra added pressure on the Celtics? We, we, I mean, we just mentioned the 64 win season, winning the East by 14 games. I believe you said the additions of a couple stars like Porzingis and, and Drew Holiday, having been so close in, in recent years. You know, this is the Boston Celtics we're talking about. Seven. NBA championships, there's there, the expectations are always very high with this organization. Do you think that brings a little bit of added pressure for this team? Yeah, there is pressure. There's pressure from ownership. There's pressure from the city um, because the Celtics are the last basically major pro sports team not to win a championship. The Sox won it in 18. The Patriots won it in uh, what 20, 21, one of those years. The Patriots when they when they beat the. Uh, with they beat the Rams, uh, Brady's last Super Bowl was a 2019, I want to say. Um, the Bruins won in 11, and the Celtics last won in 08. And as much as we're really reminded of that 08 team, um, that's a generation ago now. It's 16 years ago. You know, they're 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 young people uh, who were 16, 17, who barely were who were infants when that team, and they're in high school now. They're seniors in high school. So there's a whole generation of young people, to be honest who have no recollection of that 08 team. And so there is kind of like a, okay, when it's been 10 years since kind of the total rebuild and trading uh, Garnett and Allen, sorry, Garnett and Pierce away and rebuilding and, uh, you know, Jalen Brown's in his eighth year, Tatum's in his seventh year. Like, when is it going to happen? So there is a pressure, uh, inherent pressure in the city about winning because, They've been so close, you know. They've been the best team in the East, sustained with wins and that type of thing. But then they've watched Cleveland win. They've watched Milwaukee win. They watched Toronto win. You know, they've watched other teams go up there and take what they feel like is theirs. And last year, Denver, you know, and, and all, you know, and you can they weren't comparable. The Golden Golden State was a great team, but they've watched teams put put it together for one year, like the Bucks or like the Raptors, um, and have that championship season. So there is kind of like, well, when's it going to happen for this team? And so there is an inherent pressure on winning a championship because they've worked, they feel like they've done everything right to get there. Yeah. And, and uh, certainly the, the Boston sports fan uh, is a passionate fan base, but I'm sure they're, they are growing a bit impatient with their, with their Celtics. You know, one of the other things that I was looking at is, uh, the the Celtics path, and I'm looking a little bit beyond this this current series now, but their current path to the NBA Finals through the Eastern Conference, I mean, it's really laid out perfectly for them because if you look around the landscape of the East right now, there's a lot of key injuries to uh, some of the stars on some of these other teams that are in the playoffs. I mean, Julius Randle is not available for the Knicks. Um, uh, Giannis is banged up. Embiid is not playing at 100%. Jimmy Butler is out. So to me, there is absolutely no excuse for the Celtics not to reach the NBA Finals when they're playing at just about what full strength uh, with all the firepower they have. Uh, no excuses right now for the Celtics to to get to the Finals. What's your take on that? Yeah, you're right. Um Miami without Jimmy Butler and Terry Rozier, one of those key midseason acquisitions. Cleveland, I mean, if they were to lose to, to to the Cavaliers, that would be highly disappointing. That I think the consensus is they're a much better team than Cleveland if Cleveland were to get past Orlando. And then you're looking at the conference finals, it's gonna I mean, I think we all I think I don't think the Philadelphia New York series is over, but If New York were to get past Philly, and Philly still might take a bite out of them, it still might go six, seven games, even though, you know, because Philly now has got to probably 
get back at home and th their goals, are, and I think they're very capable of tying it at two and then all of a sudden it's a best of three. And then whoever, if the Knicks play the Bucks, that's going to be a, a brutal series in terms of physicality. And the Celtics will have the Cavaliers, you know, and, and was, yeah, like I think that's an easier road than having to go through New York and Philly and whoever comes out of that is going to be bruised and scarred up from probably a long series whether it's the Bucks with the Knicks, those two teams are going to literally, it's going to be bloodshed in that series, <laughs> you know, and, and then they're going to get to Boston, and Boston is going to come off a series with Cleveland, who's a solid team, but not on the elite level of the Celtics at all, right? So you're right, the road to the finals has been paved for them, and it's up for them to take advantage and not slip. Don't let these series with Miami go too long. Don't let Miami take you to six games and where you got you might come away with an injury or tired. You want to get proper rest. So their focus, even though they're up one, everybody's, oh, they're, they're going to coast in the series. No, not necessarily. Miami is a team that's going to make adjustments. They're going to muck up the game. They're going to try to take a chunk out of the Celtics because of this rivalry. You got to make your job easier with this, at the Celtics. Get through this series, get some rest up, get ready for Cleveland's big men and Donovan Mitchell and um, Darius Garland and those guys, and then get to the finals, and then the opponent is probably beat up too, and you have probably the advantage. So it's there. They just got to take advantage of the opportunities and not play with their food. Absolutely. Uh, well said there. Uh, just a final question I have for you here. And again, we're, we're kind of looking ahead here, but we'll have a little fun with it. Uh, does it seem like, and if I'm wrong, you can tell me who you think is going to be there. Does it seem like we're, we're, we're setting up for a Boston Denver collision course in the NBA finals? Yeah, it seems like that. Um, I wouldn't sleep on Oklahoma city because they match up well with Denver. They, I think they beat them three out of four this year. So if they have home court advantage and they're able to make it like, I don't, I wouldn't sleep on the thunder, um, beating the Nuggets because of the matchup, because it just seems to be a favorable matchup for them. We'll see how experience plays out or lack thereof for Oklahoma City. But it seems like Denver is the team the Celtics are like looking at and being like, yeah, we're pro that's the team we're probably going to see at the end. Defending champions, the best player in the world, Jamal Murray, clutch shot maker, a guy who who just gets so overlooked and under you know underrated for his production, and then their supporting cast. So, yeah, I think the Celtics will prepare as if uh, they'll probably see Denver. Obviously, uh, you know, could, could it be Minnesota? Could the Clippers make a run? We don't know. That's the fun part about what, the season that we're in. But I think they look, they're probably know that Denver's likely to come out of the West. Absolutely. Still a long ways to go before we find that out. We'll all be following along. And you can also follow Gary's work uh, on the Boston Globe. And you can follow him on X at... G Washburn Globe. Go out there and do that. Support his work. And uh, Gary, we thank you so much for your time today. Hey, thanks a lot.